Well, hello YouTube. Now before I begin this video, I just want to say a few things. First of all, I would like to apologize for my absence. I've been busy here at college and I have a lot of work to do. But yes, I am back now and I'm continuing to make videos. Lastly, this is the avatar that I'll be using for my future videos. Credit for each of these pieces goes to my sister, Cameron Huey. Thanks a lot, Cameron. Also, remember to subscribe to my channel, Mad Dino Productions. Thank you very much. Now on to the video. Lewis Dogson had received an invitation to Wu's office after the briefing. After sending Basilton to ready the pack, he had gone down the corridors of Biosyn headquarters. Ever since the fall of the first park, his idealist's hands had been yearning to get at least a single touch of the success Hammond had earned all those years ago. But when InGen had slipped up, when they allowed his men to sneak past their barriers, his dreams had come full circle. They claimed to be a company that spared no expense, but they did not hold the pure qualities required for such a venture. They had technology that no scientist had ever dreamed of, and that was why he had hired Dennis Nedry as his own mole, a man who came from the inner workings of Hammond's little funhouse. He knew the lay of the land. He could traverse it with ease. All he had to do was bring him embryos of every little asset he ever made. No one would have even noticed. And now, after over thirty years, his work had finally come true. Sure, he never got to create any of these animals, but now he had the next best thing. A way to control them. And he had one person to thank for that. He rounded the corner to the room that once belonged to Bill Steingarten. He opened the door to see Henry Wu sitting at the table within his office. A bottle of champagne in the middle of it, along with two glasses. He looked up to see him standing in the doorway. Ah, Mr. Dogson. Come on in. Dogson sat down as Wu poured some of the champagne into his glass. Help yourself, Wu said. 1976. Good year, in my opinion. Uh, thanks. Dodson took a sip. Not bad. Of course, I only break this out when there is a cause to celebrate. Who nodded? You know what today is, I presume? Phase three? This is why you're my second. Who grinned. He poured himself some of his 1976. I remember the earliest years of InGen. I was around when Hammond made his first dinosaur, you know. Did you know that I was the main reason for engine success? They would never have gotten there without me. Do you know what, what it was that he created the first time? A Triceratops! Personally, one of the favorites of Hammond's daughter. I remember the very day I started the work on the dinosaur studies. Hammond hired me to achieve his dream. And I never told him this, but it was my dream as well. The first step of it, I mean. And what dream is that? Dogson asked. The dream of shaping the new world. Who placed his glass on the table? Science has been the living blood of all of creation. Ever since the beginning of man's reign over the world, we have proven our steady hand at controlling the natural system of economic growth. The structural figure of InGen's resume over the years has stood above 
anything all over labs across the world. But the world has not even known it. But without Injun, there has been no control. The public world has had no order with their government. Tight hands who don't even know what it is that they wield. They hold power in their hands, just, but just like Hammond, just like Miss Ronnie, they abuse it. They thought they knew what they were dealing with. And look where that got them. Yeah, I remember that Hammond was real intent on his idea for a park. Doggison seemed very interested at hearing InGen's secrets. I already had one down in Kenya, trying to rip off Disney World's Animal Kingdom. Clearly, he wasn't satisfied with that. That is what I tried to tell him, Wu continued. He himself thought that the world needed a man like him. But it needed just the opposite. Biosyn is not a terrorist organization, as some may come to believe. No. We are idealists. We are politicians. We crave to reign in order to our broken world. Do we cause destruction in our endeavors? Yes. Do we cause some unfortunate incidents? Perhaps. Have lives been lost by the rampage of our assets? Undoubtedly. Men, women, children, enough to fill a wide variety of graveyards. And, of course, there are more to come if Phase 3 goes well. The world we live in is a cruel place. People die every day. And how is it that we are any different than what is happening? Our race needs correction, Mr. Dawson. When I've heard about your undercover mission with Nedry, I found an opportunity. Rest assured, I do not hold your intent against you. In fact, I commend you for such an action. You helped send Hammond's dream into the bleak precipice of truth. You helped me achieve my own dream. My dream of a perfect world. We are a realist company, Mr. Dawson. We break barriers to bring about the emergence of a new world. People need a person to look up to. Someone to show them the light. But in the present world, no one has given control to these races. But no more. We cannot create this perfect world without causing a few accidents. I am sure you are aware of this. A point must be made in our little adventure. And how can we do that without breaking a few eggs? Can we agree more, Henry? Dawson nodded. We at Biosyn, at the last 30 years, have spiked our research on animal sentience, hence our little chemical project. And now, with your help, we may have even surpassed in gen. Almost, we nodded. There are a few things that we must put to rest first. Loose ends, if you will. I assume that you have a visual on Facet CC67S's whereabouts? Yeah, I let him out to stretch his legs near the base of Cali. They let him hunt around to get some exercise. He never leaves there when we send him out. Because we always track him in case he goes too far. Then we use that device you put in his head to get him back in line. Excellent. He clapped his hands together. I expected nothing less from you, Dawson. After all, you seem like me in a way. Ambitious, tenacious. You do not stop at the boundaries of your studies. You break the rules here and there just to succeed in your work. I'm sure your parents are proud of you. And they would be if they weren't required for testing, Dodson shrugged. I swear the tigers I've worked on were strong-willed, were more strong-willed than them. Even they survived longer than those two. Before the two executive officials could say more in their little meeting, a blaring sound could be heard from down the halls. 
seemed to be coming from the main lounge for the bison workers. Dodson got up, clearly confused by the alarm sound. He then exited from the room and went down the hall. However, in the midst of the rising clamor coming from outside his office, Lou had not moved an inch. He merely sat in his seat with his hands held together. He poured himself another glass of champagne as he barely even blinked. He drank from his glass as he slowly rolled his head back with a sigh. Ever since the failure of the Indoraptor, there had been a major change in Wu's attitude. Less tolerant of failure, less condescending. He had nearly escaped that explosion in the facility under Lockwood Estate that night. A small brush with death taught him something. It taught him that Hammond was right about one thing. Life finds a way. Life found a way for him to live. Grace had smiled on him. And now with the luck he had received from that night, he had been given the new mindset he was blessed with today. The future was coming. And nothing could stop it. And at that moment, he did not have to leave the office to know what it was that had set off the alarms. Claire. She had been outside of the window for a long time in the snowy terrain. She had heard everything from outside as she pulled her hood over her face. She watched as Howard King pushed the button on the screen through the window. Immediately after that had happened, she took no time in rushing behind some plants as she heard the garage opening. She then watched as several large oil trucks came from the building, driving down the snow rim trail. The large silver cylinders looked as if they were carrying big supplies of oil. But she knew the truth. She knew those dinosaurs they abused were in there. They were taking them somewhere, possibly to initiate another one of those attacks. She had seen George Basilton amongst the many grunts that joined the caravan of bison workers. And then she had seen Dogson. She had heard a lot of things about this man from the people who sent her on this mission. They had told her that he was responsible for the fall of the first park. She remembered her mother once had gone to the park, back when her grandfather and Hammond were still on good terms. Could she still call him that? After learning what she truly was? Suddenly she heard footsteps. She had seen one of the mercenaries who stayed behind coming outside. She hid behind one of the boxes outside as she watched him pull out a walkie-talkie. Adams to Woo. All seems well outside. Dogson and his men are now en route to California to begin the mission. Excellent, came Woo's voice. Do get yourself something warm. It must be freezing in there. I've got a message to send. When the man had gone back inside from the cold... Maisie seized her chance to pull out her own little phone. She spoke into it as she bundled herself up. Hello? Yes, is Mr. Robinson there? Yes, Maisie, I'm here, came a burly man's voice. What have you found? Dogson's left for California, Maisie replied to Robinson. They took all their dinosaurs with them. I heard them talking about something called Phase 3. Also, I found the coordinates of Claire Deering. She and her crew have gone to Isla Sorna. Impossible. Robinson's voice came again. Sorna's been labeled a dead zone since before the second park. Why would they be going there? Search me, Maisie replied before glancing in through a window. She could see Wu walking down the hall, carrying that staff. She remembered Benjamin Lockwood inherited the staff from John Hammond himself. But how in the world did he get it fixed? It was shattered into a million pieces. And how is it that he slipped past the investigation of the whole estate following Mill's death? Staring into another window, she saw what looked like the main laboratories for the whole facility. Wu looked as if he had just finished a recording of some sorts, as shown with the equipment around him. He was seen conversing with several of the scientists present. 
Staying out of sight, she watched as a strange container was seen being carried by two workers to a separate room labeled, Restricted Area, Do Not Enter. No, no way, she could not go in there. She had already gotten there and gave Mr. Robinson the news about Phase 3. Besides that, there were bias and mercenaries everywhere. How would she get in there anyway? And more importantly, why? Maisie, are you still there? She had forgotten Robinson was still on. Uh, yes, Mr. Robinson, Maisie answered. Do you have Sorna's coordinates? Yes, I do, Robinson replied. We at Manticore thank you, Maisie Lockwood. We now know what Bison is planning. Rest assured, I will uphold our end of the deal. We will bring Miss Deering back. I'm sending my men on said mission as we speak and another to head to California to track down Dogson and his men. Stay safe. Will do. Over and out. Maisie then listened to him hang up. She watched as a bison worker came out of another garage at the other side of the building. He stood at the side of a truck that had just arrived with what looked like a few dozen supplies. The conversation he had with the driver only seemed to confirm it. Maisie then got her idea. She saw one of the metal boxes in the back. I hope this works. Okay, that should be the last of them. So why would Wu want these things in here? Because he requires this equipment to test on the newest assets. CC-67S won't be around forever, you know. Yeah. Better go stand by. Don't know when Dogson's starting Phase 3. The ever-fading footsteps and the closing of a door was all it took for Maisie to conclude that the two mercs had left the room, wherever it was. She sat in the box for a moment to listen around in case there were other men nearby. It was silent. She peeked out to do a quick check, and sure enough, no one was around. And as she climbed out, she found herself in a place that brought back more memories of Lockwood's estate. Purple light had shined throughout the whole secret lab. Test tubes stood on just about every table, each one holding a light purple type of liquid. She walked around, staring at every mechanical device present. All of the chemicals that she saw was undoubtedly that accursed substance, Hurasim. Her heart ached for the dinosaurs they were using for their dirty scheme. It put even Mills to shame. She knew that the ferocity of the giant creatures attacking the outside world, even before they were drugged, was, in no way, their fault. It was what any predator had to do to survive. Lockwood saw this too. He shared his beliefs with her and taught her a very important lesson, one that he learned from his own experience. That and John Hammond. If they could only step aside, and trust in nature, then life would find a way. The minute that strange sound reached her ears, did she jump in fright. She looked around to see if she could find the machine that had made that sound. Then she stopped to ponder to herself. That hadn't sounded like any machine she had ever heard. Back in the labs below Lockwood State, there was a large assortment of machines present, courtesy of Wu's little conspiracy. The noise came again, a sort of chattering. Like a bird mixed with that of a crocodile hatching. Maisie looked around to see where this sound was coming from. When it came again, she followed it much more closely. And there she had a good hunch as to where it was coming from. A container of some sorts covered by a protective cover. Strangely enough, there were holes in the top. Perhaps this was what those two mercenaries were talking about. And there seemed to be more chirps than one coming from the box. When she opened it, she saw what it was that was making these sounds. Raptors. Baby raptors. There were at least eight of them in there, each of which was a different color, each a different skin pattern. Maisie knew that there were many varieties of Velociraptor skin patterns, 
as she had seen Blue and her sisters and how they differed from each other. But most of them were strange looking. One of them was gray with black spots. Two of them were a light orange with black stripes, like a tiger. One was purple with quills on his head, a trait it shared with a red one and an olive green one. There were also two with a gray and black spotted skin pattern like the first one. One had a black stripe down its head, while the other had browner eyes in comparison to the other one's golden ones. And the last one was the most bizarre out of the lot. Lime green with orange eyes and seemingly the youngest. The last one seemed to be playing with a ball of some sort. Maisie stared at the infant velociraptors with widened eyes. For so long, the world knew these dinosaurs to be virtually extinct, with the last one lost in the outside world. So seeing a batch of hatchlings of this species living and breathing before her eyes was a rather big surprise. The small gaggle, or whatever a group of velociraptor hatchlings was called, all stopped what they were doing and stared up, to, up at her with their expressionless reptile eyes. They made no signs of hostility as a lead gray female chirped lightly. One of the quilled ones stood by her side and began to sniff like a dog. Its tail swished about in a calm yet cautious manner. The others all stood behind the gray female as if, as if they followed her command. She turned to the male next to her and gave a few small grunts. He slightly dipped his head in submission. Maisie had seen the videos of Blue and her sisters training under Owen Grady. So she had seen how even as hatchlings, pack behavior ran through a raptor's blood as if it were pure instinct. It was all fascinating to her. She barely even got to see Blue when Neil's plan went awry. So she hadn't gone to see her main actions as a species. Now she had the chance to watch how they behaved in person. But the question was, where did Wu find them? What was he going to do with them? The approaching footsteps were enough to catch her attention away from the baby raptors. She put the cover back on the container before ducking into a nearby closet. When she heard the main door open, she recognized the voice. She was not prepared for Henry, Henry Wu to be so close to her. Mr. King, I would like to commend you for your gallant research, he said to the man next to him. Thanks to your creative mind, the world will soon be born anew. Hammonsons will finally be punished. It was nothing really, Dr. Wu, Howard King replied in a troubled voice. But I have to ask... What'll we do when this is over? When this phase three is finished? Simple answer, Howard, we replied. We will be in control of it all. We will succeed in the purpose of John Hammond's research where no one has ever dared to venture. I ask you to take a good look at me, Mr. King. I want you to look at everything in this room. How do you think any of this could have been possible with the feeble efforts of Hammond's loyalists? He wanted to create dinosaurs for a theme park. A theme park, Howard. He saw creatures where I saw exploitation. Exploitation and yet so much more. And when Mizrani took over, I purposed my views to him. And you know what he did? He froze everything I worked so hard to make beneath InGen Labs. He refused to use them for what he called global terrorism. We are not terrorists, Mr. King. We are the saviors of the world. We are the government the world needs. The gods Hammond and Mesbrani have failed to be. We are the people who care for the global environment. We show them all what they wish to see. We are Biosyn. And what Maisie heard the crazed former geneticist say next truly chilled her. For your best interests.